Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our next talk on the Diversity and Inclusion in STEM Part 2 Symposium. This is the last symposium of our great event. Before we start, I would like to give a special thanks again to our sponsors that are making possible for us to put together this um, fantastic event. And um, right now, I would like to uh, invite Professor uh, Gabriel Weber She's a professor in Universidade de São Paulo, Campus Lorena, here in Brazil. And I'm, I'd like to thank you very much, uh, Professor Gabriel, for being here with us. It's a pleasure to receive you and to hear your fantastic talk. Um, remind, uh, remind, like, would like to remind everyone that you can put your questions in the chat in either Portuguese or English. So thank you very much again, Professor Gabriel. And, uh, it's all the stage is yours. Can you see my slides? Yes, perfectly. Okay, so I'll be talking about diversity and inclusivity inclusion for LGBTQIA plus individuals in science. And let's start. So my uh, my goal in this talk is to tell you what is it like to be LGBTQIA plus in STEM. And what do, you, that do we face in our daily basis? And how can we make academia a more inclusive and diverse place? So first things first, I would like to tell you what the acronym LGBTQIA plus means. So it's an amalgam of identities, which has this L for lesbians, G for gays, B for bisexuals, T for transgender, I for intersex, A for asexuals, the Q for queers, and the queers do not have a flag for themselves. And plus, and uh, are for very for many more identities like demisexuals and and some and many others that I won't be able to rem remember everything. And as you can see, this acronym is an umbrella term for gender identities and sexuality identities. So if you want to understand what's going on with LGBTQ people and the problems we face, we need to understand more or less how we understand the human being and how we live in society. So we need to understand what gender and sexuality really means. And for this, I present you the very familiar and very uh, known, um, oh, I forgot the name. I'm terrible with names. And that was one, one of the reasons I didn't go to biology. Um, so we have some concepts that are not dependent, they are independent and they work, even though we try in our common understanding, we see them together, they are not the same thing. And this goes for gender identity, gender expression, sexual or romantic attraction, and finally, for biological sex. They are all independent quantities that somehow are, seem to be correlated in nature, as I will explain later. But let me first try to explain to you what I mean by those terms. And by gender identity, I mean how we see, how we perceive ourselves. And this can be either some combination of woman, man, or nothing, or something in between. Some people understand themselves as woman or a man or nothing at all. So it's how we see ourselves. As for gender expression, this is how we present ourselves to society. If we wear feminine clothes, um, move around the world in a masculine manner or something in between. So it's how we interface with the world. Finally, biological sex is just a name for very, for many different entities. And, it includes all our regional configurations, whether we were born in vaginas, penises, ovaries, testicles, or we have XX or XY chromosomes. It's all the equipment under the hood. And finally, um, sexual or romantic attraction uh, concerns who are we attracted to? Or am I attracted to woman, to man, or both or none? So it happens that in nature, all these quantities they, are, they appear in bimodal distributions and they are apparently correlated with our biological sex. So there are, we can exp split humanity into two bell curves 
and we had the correlation between genitals and, for instance, uh, gender expression or gender identity or sexuality. But this is just some correlation. And if you did your statistics, and you know that correlation doesn't imply causation. So this is just some apparent effect that emerges when we scale up nature. And this uh, apparent correlation has some nasty consequences because we try to do, uh, humanity tries to make some bijections between what is to be born with a penis and to like women and to present yourself in a masculine manner. But this is just some emergent, emergent vision that is based on a false correlation, which we call binarism. And this binarism, that's all this locking of those vectors that is not real, it's just apparent, leads to, very, to many problems in our society, like traditional or oppositional sexism, that traditional sexism relates to how we degrade feminine traits and oppositional sexism, how we define woman as an opposite of men. So we usually say that men are tall, men are strong, women are short, women are weak. And heteronormativity is the correlation between uh, genitals and sexuality. And cisnormativity is the correlation between genitals and gender, gender identity. So I beg those questions to you because as LGBT people, we don't see heterosexual people being asked when they have figured out who they are or cisgender people being asked when they figure out that they are cisgender. But those are quite common questions for LGBTQ people. And since academ academia is just a part of society and society has all these problems, it's not a big surprise that these problems are in academia and they are much more pronounced because of the privileges that we take to get into academia. And there were some recent studies that started to try to understand the diversity and inclusion of LGBTQ IE plus identities in STEM. It's quite new. The first one I'm aware of was done in 2016 by the American Physical Society. And they interviewed mostly almost 300, a bit more than 300 participants in the USA. Later on in 2019, there were studied by the Institute of Physics, the Royal Astronomy Society, and the Royal Chemical Society, involving a bit more than a thousand participants in the UK and Ireland, and a quite similar but not so broad study made by the Brazilian Physicist Society in 2018 with almost 1,700 participants. And they were asking mostly the first two. How is, what is it like to be LGBTQA plus in science? And the first thing they found out is that something that we already know because we are in science is that ident personal identities do not matter. We are measured by the work we do, how many papers we publish, in which journals we publish, but it's a taboo to talk about our personal lives in academia, especially when you are from some minority like LGBTQA plus. AI plus people. And they found out that diversity is not still not welcome. For instance, uh, those are the, the results from the IOP and the APS studies. I, I forgot which one is from which, but they had very similar findings. And you see, for instance, if you take lesbian woman, you can see that a vast proportion is not comfortable in academia. And it's compatible with the results from the other study that says that LGBT women is 25% of LGBT women are not comfortable. And if you look at gender conforming individuals, it's better now to call them non binary people or gender non binary. More than 25% are not comfortable in academia. And there is a clear message to stay in the closet. And they ask participants how they agreed or not with those statements. And at least 40% agreed that we are expected not to act too gay or 
to stay in the closet. We must be secretive about our lives in academia. And if we are not, we risk facing exclusionary behavior. And you see that it's prevalent for trans people or gender non-conforming people. And we see that men, LGBT men face less exclusionary behavior than women and women face less than gender non-conforming. And one statement that I found that was very indicative of the problems we face is this one. It's deliberate. I don't tell people about my trans history at work. I don't want them to change the way they act towards me. And this clarifies that it's harder for trans people because we face problems that cis people do not fancy even exists like the problem of going to the restroom. I'm not usually comfortable going to bathrooms in most of the places because we are not safe. We may risk harassment and aggression. Also, there's the issue with names and pronouns, but the, the, the problem with bathroom is really indicative of the problems of being trans people, of, of which trans people face in the real world. And the, 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 the good outcome of this research is that they found out that visibility matters. What I mean by that is that in ambient and environments where most people were out of the closet, the, ambient, the, the environment were perceived to be more comfortable. So this is a key of how solving the problem we face in academia. So now we go to my last part of my talk and how can we make science more diverse and inclusive? And the clue was in the previous slide, but first we need to know who we are. Those studies, those by APS and IOP were focused on US and UK. We know nothing about Latin America. So together with Fernanda from Prior in Science, Cristal and Rebecca, we started some survey in Brazil to know where LGBT2 people are and which difficulties and issues we face on a daily basis. We, uh, we started the, to collect data with this form in the beginning of June. We already have a thousand responses. We, we need a little bit more to start analyzing them. So if you are in Brazil, you are academic and you are LGBTQ, please fill the form and help us with our research because we need to know who we are and start doing some serious thing about it. Also, we can start talking about being LGBTQ in academia, because if visibility matters, we should show ourselves to, work, to the world. And I coordinate uh, an outreach program. And I, I've been seeing some very good results with students by talking about being LGBTQ in academia and promoting and celebrating the life of other scientists that happen to be LGBTQ. It's really important for the new generations to feel safe at academia and flourish. So thank you. Those are my social networks and where you can contact me. I hope you could understand the, the issues we face and help us to make the, the academia a better place for all identities. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriel. Uh, so we have a lot of time for for questions. We have like ten minutes for for questions. I do have. Uh, uh, oh, we ha we received a, a question here. It's in uh, Portuguese, so I will switch to Portuguese. Okay, uh, Gabriel, vocês acham que aumentar a representatividade é suficiente para a gente se sentir mais confortável na academia? Se não, que tipos de estratégias mais nós poderíamos usar no nosso dia a dia? É a pergunta da Natália Caldeira, desculpa. Esqueci. Oi, Natália, muito obrigada pela pergunta. O que um dos estudos, agora eu estou de novo confundindo, não sei qual é o da IOP e qual da APS, mostrou é que estar fora do armário, ou seja, ter pessoas LGBTQIA+, visíveis, ajuda na questão do conforto, de ser um ambiente que promove diversidade e inclusividade. Então, é um primeiro passo, e é um passo que não é tão difícil de fazer porque a gente tem cientistas LGBTQIA+, na academia, só que eles estão com medo de mostrar a cara por causa de preconceito, por causa de é, assédio, que é muito comum. Então, se a gente consegue mostrar a cara brigando por políticas institucionais que nos protejam, existem já algumas legislações para nos proteger, mas elas não são tão efetivas, depende muito do campus que você está, de onde você está, mas isso é um bom começo 
e começar a lutar para ter políticas institucionais para proteger a gente contra assédio. E depois disso, um próximo passo, depois que a gente souber melhor quem nós somos e quais são os problemas, que essa é a grande proposta dessa nossa pesquisa, é propor políticas institucionais um pouco mais precisas. É, eu já, a gente já tem uma certa noção do que, que deve aparecer, dados os outros estudos, o Brasil não é tão diferente do resto do mundo. E, então, provavelmente, políticas voltadas para população trans podem envolver é, a questão do uso de banheiros de uma maneira mais clara, melhores regras para mudança de nomes. Então, é um grande problema que a gente encontra na nos jornais, né? Tipo, corrigir nomes é uma coisa muito chata. É, outra coisa que pode acontecer, principalmente para a população trans, também é a questão de cotas, da mesma forma que a gente tem cotas raciais. Uma das coisas que a gente imagina, que, que a gente tem certeza que a gente vai ter que propor, né? já é um problema conhecido, é essa questão de cotas para pessoas trans na universidade. Então tem, tem várias políticas, a gente precisa saber um pouco mais em detalhes o que, que a gente encontra, mas o primeiro passo é a visibilidade. Muito bom, Manuel. Obrigado pela resposta. Uh, eu tenho vários comentários aqui. Uh... Uh, Fernanda Stanislavski falou em Very Talk Be So Important to Raise This Issue in Academia. Uh, Angélica Dias uh, disse maravilhosa, pauta importantíssima, parabéns pela iniciativa. Uh, Maria Eduarda de Andrade Borges uh, disse muito obrigado, Gabriele, pela palestra incrível, tema super importante uh, e que devemos estar debatendo dentro de nossas universidades para poder mudar essa realidade. A Natália Cadeira agradeceu pela, pela resposta, falou muito obrigado pela resposta, pela apresentação, obrigado e parabéns pela pesquisa de vocês. Os slides são lindos e sua voz também. Obrigada. É, uh, eu tenho uma pergunta da Alina Cabaleiro também. É, na, tu, na sua percepção, qual é o papel da educação no combate à violência contra pessoas trans na academia e como as ciências podem ajudar a combater a violência contra a população trans? Ok, vamos lá. Educação é tudo. Se a gente, Porque o que acaba acontecendo é a gente gosta de agredir como ser humano que a gente desconhece. tá? Então, se a gente voltar para a questão da escravidão de séculos atrás, como é que os europeus justificavam a escravidão? Falando que pessoas negras não tinham alma. E por isso elas mereciam ser tratadas como elas eram. Ou seja, limpando um pouco da da nossa alma, né? do, do nosso impacto. Né? Tipo, eu não estou agredindo um ser humano. Então, educação é importante para a gente reconhecer a pessoa diferente como uma outra pessoa. E não apenas como um ser aí que está incomodando o, o andar da carruagem. Ou é, perturbando um sistema que aparentemente parece funcionar muito bem, mas que está baseado em informações incompletas. Então, tudo, tudo que a gente vive na nossa sociedade cis, heteronormativa e binária é uma consequência dessas correlações entre genitália, sexo, gênero, identidade de gênero, sexualidade. E isso está baseado em observações frágeis. Então, a educação começa daí de perceber que a humanidade é muito mais diversa. E quando a gente percebe que essa diversidade ela existe, é muito mais fácil da gente aceitar. Então, a educação está em mostrar esse tipo de dado, mostrar esse tipo de modelagem, né, que a gente tem essa diversidade, não é esse binário estrito que ou existe homem que nasceu com pênis, que gosta de mulher e que se veste de maneira masculina, e mulher que nasceu sem pênis, porque a nossa sociedade ainda é machista, que gosta de homem, que se comporta como mulher... Então, a gente tem que quebrar essa bijeção, que é uma bijeção falsa, porque ela foi montada em correlações fortuitas, né? Para a binariedade. Então, a educação entra isso, né? Desmontar isso. E dentro da ciência, o que a gente pode fazer, né? Tem muito cientista que fala, ah, não, vou estudar qual que é o gene gay, vou tentar estudar por que, que uma pessoa é trans. Assim, é importante esse tipo de estudo, mas o viés está errado. Porque o viés, dessa forma, está falando que ser gay é errado. Ser trans é errado. Então, tem que mudar um pouco o viés. Óbvio, é importantíssimo a gente entender o que, que causa a diversidade de gêneros, o que, que causa essa, esse, talvez, descompasso entre genitália e identidade de gênero. Por que, que existem essas diferenças? Por que, que algumas pessoas são cisgêneras e outras são transgêneras? Então, isso são perguntas em aberto que vão ajudar muito a gente a lidar com 
a diversidade das populações, né? as, as dificuldades que cada população enfrenta. Mas é muito importante tomar cuidado com o jeito que essas questões são abordadas e para não cair em algumas coisas eugenistas, porque, pelo menos, como uma pessoa trans, eu tenho muito medo desses estudos no sentido de ser alguma coisa corretiva, né? Tá, tudo bem, agora a gente sabe o que tem de errado com você e a gente pode corrigir. Mas quem disse que tem alguma coisa de errado comigo? Quem disse que essa coisa precisa ser corrigida? Então, tem vários problemas que acade... éticos que a academia encontra no aspecto de lidar com pessoas trans, pessoas LGBTQIA+, de uma maneira geral, em relação a não tratar as pessoas cis, hetero, sexu... cisgêneras e heterossexuais como, espe... como normais. Exceto se for do ponto de vista estatístico. Sim, perfeito. Obrigado, obrigado. Ótima resposta. É, tenho mais uma pergunta aqui da, da Lina. É, você está em inglês, eu vou mudar aqui. Many people believe that the danger is diversity and not the continuity of male chauvinism and binding heterosexuality. What is the relevance of diversity in relation to the changing character of the world? Okay, I, I can start uh, quoting. There's, there, are, there are some very important studies published in Nature, for instance, relating diversity to good science. So diversity is important for bringing new ways of thinking. If I grew up in some environment, I'm taught to think in a distinct way. If someone is born in a completely different environment, they, is learn, they will learn to think in very different ways. Uh, I like to, to tell some tale about the Odyssey and the Iliad, because in ancient Greek, there was no word for blue. And people, but does that mean that people do not, did not see blue back in those ancient times? No, they did see blue, but they didn't have a word for it. So they changed it all the way they thought because they didn't have a word for it. So our environment or our language or the way we interact with our environment shape the way we perceive the world. And being different brings new views of world, new mentalities into life. So it's important if you want to be like the United Federation of Planets and live in the utopia like that is Star Trek, that's an inclusive word, we need to bring all this to the table. And it's important to discuss this openly and have shows like Star Trek that brings it to the great public. And science has the leading voice in this kind of things because we search for what is wrong and tell what's definitely wrong from what may be true. So I hope I answered your question. It was really a broad question. I think I think you covered pretty much uh, everything. Uh, I have more uh, compliments in the chat. Uh, so I think um, that's it. I would like to thank you very much, Gabriel, for your participation. It's a pleasure to have you here. I would also like to, to thank everyone that sent questions and are that stand with us uh, till now. I would like to remind you that we have um, another talk uh, next. And also I would like to thank Sean for helping us and all the people from UNC Charlotte. And uh, thank you very much, Gabriel, again. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure talking with you. Thank you.